Dennis Andrew Nilsson, born November 23, 1945, is a Scottish serial killer and necrophiliac, also known as the Muswell Hill Murderer and the Kindly Killer, who murdered at least 12 young men in a series of killings committed between 1978 and 1983 in London, England. Convicted of six counts of murder and two of attempted murder at the Old Bailey, Nelson was sentenced to life imprisonment on November 4, 1983, with a recommendation that he serve a minimum of 25 years. He is currently incarcerated at HMP Full Sutton Maximum Security Prison in Full Sutton in the East Riding of Yorkshire, England. All of Nelson's murders were committed in two North London addresses in which he alternately resided throughout the years he is known to have killed. His victims would be lured to these addresses through guile and all were murdered by strangulation, sometimes accompanied by drowning. Following the murder, Nelson would observe a ritual in which he bathed and dressed the victims' bodies, which he would retain for extended periods of time before dissecting and disposing of the remains via burning upon a bonfire, or flushing the remains down a lavatory. Nilsson became known as the Muswell Hill Murderer as his later murders were committed in the Muswell Hill district of North London, he also became known as the Kindly Killer, in reference to his belief that his method of murder was the most humane. Owing to the similar modus operandi of the murderers, Nilsson has been described as the British Jeffrey Dahmer. Dennis Andrew Nilsson was born on November 23, 1945 in Fraserburg, Aberdeenshire, the second of three children born to Elizabeth Duffy White, and Olav Magnus Mokshaim, who had adopted the surname Nilsson. Nilsson was of Scottish and Norwegian heritage, his father was a Norwegian soldier who had travelled to Scotland in 1940 as part of the Free Norwegian Forces, following the Nazi occupation of Norway. After a brief courtship, he had married Elizabeth White in May 1942 and the newlyweds moved into her parents' house. The marriage between Nelson's parents was beset with difficulties. Olav Nelson did not view married life with any degree of seriousness, being preoccupied with his duties with the Free Norwegian Forces, and making little attempt to either spend much time with or find a new home for his wife. After the birth of her third child, Nelson's mother concluded she had rushed into marriage without thinking. The couple divorced in 1948. All three of the couple's children, Olav Jr., Dennis and Sylvia, had been conceived on their father's brief visits to the mother's household. Her parents, Andrew and Lily, nay Duffy, White, who had never approved of their daughter's choice of husband, were supportive of their daughter following her divorce, and considerate of their grandchildren. Nelson was a quiet yet adventurous child. His earliest childhood memories were of family picnics in the Scottish countryside with his mother and siblings, of his grandparents' pious lifestyle, which he would later describe as being cold and dour, and of being taken on long countryside walks as he sat on the shoulders of his maternal grandfather, to whom Nelson was particularly close. Although Olav Jr. and Sylvia would occasionally accompany Dennis and his grandfather on these walks, on most occasions, Dennis alone would accompany his grandfather. Despite only being five years old, Nelson vividly recalled these walks with his grandfather as being very long along the harbor, across the wide stretch of beach, up to the sand dunes, which rise thirty feet behind the beach, and on to Inveralaki. Nelson would later describe this stage of his childhood as being one of contentment, and his grandfather being his great hero and protector, adding that, whenever his grandfather, who worked as a fisherman, was at sea, life would be empty for me until he returned. By 1951 Nelson's grandfather's health was in decline, although he continued to work as a fisherman. On October 31, 1951, while fishing in the North Sea, Andrew White died of a heart attack. His body was brought ashore and returned to the Nelson family home prior to burial. In what Nelson would later describe as being his most vivid childhood recollection, his mother, weeping, asked him whether he would like to see his grandfather. When he replied that he would, he was taken into the room where his grandfather lay in an open coffin. As Nelson gazed upon his grandfather's body, 
he recalled noticing his heart beating strongly as he was told by his mother, See, Dennis. There's your grandfather, he's sleeping. In the years following the death of his grandfather, Nelson became more quiet and reserved, often standing alone at the harbor watching the herring boats, on which his grandfather had fished, sail by. At home, he seldom participated in family activities and would actively repel any attempts by adult family members to demonstrate any affection towards him. Nilsson also grew to resent what he saw as the unfair amount of attention his mother, grandmother and later, stepfather would show towards his older brother and, to a lesser degree, his younger sister. In spite of Nilsson's increasing bitterness towards his brother, he envied Olav's popularity. Nonetheless, when not opting to partake in solo activities, he would often talk to or play games with his younger sister, Sylvia, with whom he was closer than any other family member. On one of his solo excursions to the beach at Inveraliki in 1954 or 1955, Nelson became submerged beneath the water and was almost dragged out to sea. Nelson initially panicked, flailing his arms and shouting. As he gasped for air which wasn't there he recalled believing that his grandfather was about to arrive and pull him out, before experiencing a sense of tranquility. His life was saved by another youngster who dragged him ashore. Shortly after this near-fatal incident, Nilsson's mother moved out of her mother's home and into a flat with her three children. She would later marry a builder named Andrew Scott, with whom she had four further children in as many years. Although Nilsson initially resented his stepfather, whom he viewed as a disciplinarian, he gradually grew to respect him. The family moved to the village of Strachan in 1955. At the onset of puberty, Nilsson discovered he was homosexual, which initially both confused and shamed him. He did not divulge his sexuality to either his family or his few friends, but kept it a secret. Because many of the boys to whom he was attracted bore similar facial features to his younger sister, Sylvia, on one occasion he sexually fondled his sister, believing that his attraction towards boys might be a manifestation of the care he felt for her. He made no direct efforts to seek sexual contact with any of the peers to whom he was sexually attracted, although he would later claim to have himself been fondled by an older youth. On one occasion, he also caressed and fondled the body of his older brother as he slept. As a result of this incident, Olav Jr. began to suspect his brother was homosexual, and regularly belittled Dennis in public, referring to him as hen, Scottish slang for girl. Although Nelson initially believed that his fondling of his sister may have been evidence that he was bisexual. As Nelson progressed into adolescence, he found life in Stricken increasingly stifling, with limited entertainment amenities or career opportunities. Although he respected his parents' efforts to provide and care for their children, he began to resent the fact that his family was poorer than most of his peers, with his mother and stepfather making no effort to better their lifestyles. Thus, Nelson seldom invited his few friends to the family home. At the age of 14, he joined the Army Cadet Force, and later recalled his viewing the British Army as a potential avenue for escaping his rural origins. Nelson's scholastic record was above average, though not exemplary. Although he displayed a flair for both history and art, he was known to shun sports of any kind. He finished his schooling in 1961 and briefly worked in a canning factory as he considered which career path he should choose. After three weeks at the factory, Nelson informed his mother that he intended to join the army, where he intended to train as a chef. Nelson passed the entrance examinations and received official notification he was to enlist for nine years' service in September 1961 commencing his training at St. Omer Barracks in Aldershot. Within weeks, Nelson began to excel in his army duties, he would later describe his three years of training at Aldershot as the happiest of my life. He relished the travel opportunities afforded him in his training, and recalled one particular highlight was his regiment taking part in a ceremonial parade attended by both the Queen and Lord Montgomery. While stationed at Aldershot, Nilsson's latent homosexual feelings began to stir, although he kept his sexual orientation well hidden from his colleagues. 
Nilsson never showered in the company of his fellow soldiers for fear of developing an erection in their presence, instead opting to bathe alone in the bathroom, which also afforded him the privacy to masturbate without discovery. In mid-1964, Nelson passed his initial catering exam and was officially assigned to the 1st Battalion the Royal Fusiliers in Osnabrück, West Germany, where he served as a private. In this deployment, Nelson began to increase his intake of alcohol, he described himself and his colleagues as a hard-working, boozy lot, although his colleagues would recollect he often drank to excess in order to ease his shyness. On one occasion, Nilsson and a German youth drank themselves into a stupor. When Nilsson awoke, he found himself on the floor of the German youth's flat. Although no sexual activity had occurred, this incident fueled Nilsson's fantasies. He began to develop sexual fantasies which initially involved his sexual partner, invariably a young, slender male, being completely passive. These fantasies would gradually evolve into his partner being completely unconscious or dead. On several occasions, Nilsson also made tentative efforts to have his own prone body sexually interfered with by one of his colleagues. In these instances, whenever he and his colleagues would drink to excess, he would pretend he was inebriated in the hope one of his colleagues would make sexual use of his supposedly unconscious body. After two years' deployment, Nilsson returned to Aldershot, where he passed his official catering exam before being deployed to serve as a cook for the British Army in Norway. In 1967, he was deployed to Aden, South Yemen, where he again served as a cook at the Al Mansa'ura prison. This posting was more fraught with risks than his previous postings in West Germany or Norway, and Nilsson later recalled his regiment losing several men, often in ambushes en route to the army barracks. Nilsson was himself kidnapped by an Arab taxi driver, who beat him unconscious and placed him in the boot of his car. Upon being dragged out of the boot of the taxi, Nilsson grabbed a jack handle and knocked the taxi driver to the floor before beating him unconscious. He then locked the man in the boot of the taxi. Unlike his previous postings at Aldershot and Osnabrück, while stationed in Aden, Nilsson had his own room. This afforded him the privacy to masturbate without discovery. His developed fantasies of sex with an unresistant or deceased partner unfulfilled, Nilsson compensated by imagining sexual encounters with an unconscious body as he masturbated as he looked at his own prone, nude body in a mirror. On one occasion, Nilsson discovered that, by using a freestanding mirror, he could create an effect whereby if positioning the mirror so his head was out of view, he could visualize himself engaged in a sexual act with another man. To Nilsson, this ruse created the ideal circumstance in which he could visually split his personality. In these masturbatory fantasies, Nilsson alternately envisaged himself as being both the domineering and the passive partner. These fantasies gradually evolved to incorporate his own near-death experience with the Arab taxi driver, the dead bodies he had seen in Aden and imagery within a 19th-century oil painting entitled The Raft of the Medusa, which depicted an old man holding the limp, nude body of a deceased youth as he sat aside the dismembered body of another young male. In his most vividly recalled fantasy, a slender, attractive young blonde soldier who had been recently killed in battle would be dominated by a faceless dirty, gray-haired old man who would wash the body before engaging in intercourse with the spread gold corpse. Nilsson completed his deployment in Aden in January 1968. He returned to Britain and was assigned to serve with the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders at Seton Barracks in Plymouth. Throughout his service with this regiment, Nilsson was required to cook for 30 soldiers and two officers on a daily basis. He served at these barracks for one year before being transferred with the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders to Cyprus in 1969. Months later, the regiment was transferred to Berlin, where, the same year, he had his first sexual experience with a female, a prostitute whose services he solicited. Although he bragged of this sexual encounter to his colleagues, he later stated he found the act of intercourse with a female both overrated and depressing.
Nilsson had repeatedly engaged in sexual relations with an Arab youth while previously stationed in Aden. Following a brief period with the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders in Inverness, Nilsson was selected to cook for the Queen's Royal Guard before, in January 1971, he was reassigned to serve as cook for a different regiment in the Shetland Islands, where he ended his 11-year military career at the rank of corporal in October 1972. Between October and December 1972, Nelson lived with his family as he considered his next career move. On more than one occasion in the three months Nelson lived in Strecken, his mother voiced her opinion as to her being more concerned with Nelson's lack of female companionship than the career path he should next opt to take, and of her desire to see him marry and start a family. On one occasion, Nelson joined his older brother, Olav, his sister-in-law and another couple to watch a documentary devoted to male homosexuality. All present viewed the topic with derision, except Dennis, who ardently spoke in defense of gay rights. A fight ensued, after which Olav informed his mother that Dennis was homosexual. Nilsson never spoke to his older brother again, and maintained only sporadic written contact with his mother, stepfather and younger siblings. He decided to join the Metropolitan Police, and moved to London in December to begin the training course. In April 1973 Nilsson completed his training and was posted to Wilsdon Green. As a junior constable, Nilsson performed several arrests, although he never had to physically subdue a member of the public. Nilsson enjoyed the work, but missed the comradeship of the army. He began to drink alone in the evenings. During the summer and autumn of 1973, Nelson began frequenting gay pubs and engaged in several casual liaisons with men. Nelson viewed these encounters as soul-destroying and a vain search for inner peace as he sought a lasting relationship. In August, following a failed relationship, Nelson came to the conclusion that his personal lifestyle was at odds with his professional life. His father died the same month, leaving each of his three children £1,000. In December, Nelson resigned from the police. Between December 1973 and May 1974, Nelson worked as a security guard. The work was intermittent, and he resolved to find more stable, secure employment. He found work as a civil servant in May 1974. Nelson was initially posted to a job center in Denmark Street, where his primary role was to find employment for unskilled laborers. At his workplace, Nelson was known to be a quiet, conscientious employee, who was active in the trade union movement. Although his attendance record was hardly exemplary, Nelson frequently volunteered to work overtime. In 1979, Nelson was appointed acting executive officer. He was officially promoted to the position of executive officer, with additional supervisory responsibilities, in June 1982 and transferred to another job center in Kendish Town, continuing in this job until his arrest. In November 1975, Nelson encountered a 20-year-old named David Galichin being threatened outside a pub by two other men. Nelson intervened in the altercation and took the youth to his room at 18 Meth Road in the Cricklewood district of London. The two men spent the evening drinking and talking. Nilsson learned that Galichin had recently moved to London from Weston Supermare, was homosexual, unemployed and resided in a hostel. The following morning, both men agreed to reside together in a larger residence and Nilsson, using part of the inheritance bequeathed to him by his father, immediately resolved to find a larger property. Several days later, the pair viewed a vacant ground floor flat at 195, Melrose Avenue also located in Cricklewood. They decided to move into this property. Prior to moving into the residence, Nelson negotiated a deal with the landlord whereby he and Galichin would have exclusive use of the garden at the rear of the property. Although the flat was supposed to be furnished, upon moving in, Nelson and Galichin found it to be largely threadbare. Over the following months, Nelson and Galichin redecorated and furnished the entire flat. Much of this work was performed by Galichin, as Nilsson, 
having discovered Galichin's lack of employment ambitions, began to view himself as the breadwinner in their relationship. Nelson later recollected that, although he was sexually attracted to Galichin, the pair seldom had intercourse. Galichin was later to inform police that he was sexually uninterested in Nelson. Initially, Nelson experienced domestic contentment with Galichin, however, within a year of their moving to Melrose Avenue, the superficial relationship between the two men began to strain. They slept in separate beds, and both began to bring home casual sexual partners. Although Galichin insisted Nelson had never been violent towards him, he was regularly berated by Nelson, and by early 1976, the pair began arguing with increasing frequency. Nelson later stated that, following a heated argument in May 1977, he had demanded Galichin leave the residence. Galichin was to later inform investigators that he had himself chosen to end the relationship, although Nelson formed brief relationships with several other young men over the following 18 months. None of these relationships lasted more than a few weeks, and none of the individuals expressed any intention of living with Nelson on a permanent basis. By late 1978, Nelson was living a solitary existence, he had had a minimum of three failed relationships in the previous 18 months, and he later confessed to having developed an increasing conviction that he was unfit to live with. Throughout 1978, he devoted an ever-increasing amount of his time, effort and assiduity to his work, and most evenings would be spent consuming spirits and or lager as he listened to music. Between 1978 and 1983, Nelson is known to have killed a minimum of 12 men and boys, and to have attempted to kill seven others, he would initially confess in 1983 to having killed 15 victims. The majority of Nelson's victims were homeless or homosexual men, although others were heterosexual individuals whom he would typically meet in bars, on public transport or, on one occasion, outside his own home. All of Nelson's murders were committed inside the North London addresses where he alternately resided in the years he is known to have killed. His victims would be lured to these addresses through guile, typically the offer of alcohol and or shelter. Inside Nelson's home, the victims were usually given food and alcohol, then strangled, usually with a ligature, either to death or until they had become unconscious. If the victim had been strangled into unconsciousness, Nelson would then drown the victim in his bathtub, his sink or a bucket of water before observing a ritual in which he would bathe, clothe and retain the victim's bodies inside his residences for several weeks or, occasionally, months before he would dismember the corpse. Each victim killed between 1978 and 1981 at his Cricklewood residence would be disposed of via burning upon a bonfire, although prior to their dissection, Nelson would routinely remove their internal organs, which he would dispose of either beside a fence behind his property, or close to Gladstone Park. The victims killed in 1982 and 1983 at his Muswell Hill residence would be retained at his flat, with their flesh and smaller bones flushed down the lavatory. Although Nilsson admitted to engaging in masturbation as he viewed the nude bodies of several of his victims, and to have engaged in sexual acts with six of his victims' bodies, he was adamant he had never penetrated any of his victims. Nilsson killed his first victim. 14-year-old Stephen Holmes, on December 30, 1978. Holmes encountered Nelson in the Cricklewood Arms pub, where Holmes had attempted to purchase alcohol. According to Nelson, he had been drinking heavily the day he met Stephen Holmes, and invited the youth to his house to drink alcohol with him, believing him to be approximately 17 years old. At Nelson's home, both Nelson and Holmes drank heavily, before they fell asleep. The following morning, Nelson awoke to find Holmes asleep on his bed. In his subsequent written confessions, Nelson stated he was afraid to wake him in case he left me. After caressing the sleeping youth, Nelson decided Holmes was to stay with me over the new year whether he wanted to or not. Reaching for a necktie, Nelson straddled Holmes as he strangled him into unconsciousness, before drowning the youth in a bucket filled with water. Nilsson twice masturbated over the body of Stephen Holmes, before stowing the youth's corpse beneath his floorboards. 
the body of Stephen Holmes would remain beneath the floorboards for almost eight months, before Nelson constructed a bonfire in the garden behind his flat and burned the bound corpse on August 11, 1979. Reflecting on his killing spree in 1983, Nelson stated that, having killed Holmes, I caused dreams which caused death this is my crime, adding that he had started down the avenue of death and possession of a new kind of flatmate. On October 11, 1979, Nelson attempted to murder a student from Hong Kong named Andrew Ho, whom he had met in a St. Martin's Lane pub and lured to his flat on the promise of sex. Nelson attempted to strangle Ho, who managed to flee from his flat and reported the incident to police. Although Nelson was questioned in relation to the incident, Ho decided not to press charges. Two months after the attempted murder of Ho, on December 3, 1979, Nelson encountered a 23-year-old Canadian student named Kenneth Ockenden, who had been on a tour of Britain visiting relatives. Nelson encountered Doc Hendon as they both drank in a West End pub. Upon learning the youth was a tourist, Nelson offered to show Doc Hendon several notable London landmarks, an offer which Doc Hendon accepted. Nelson then invited the youth to his house on the promise of a meal and further drinks. The pair stopped at an off-license en route to Nelson's Melrose Avenue residence and purchased whiskey, rum and beer, with Doc Hendon insisting on sharing the bill. Although Nilsson was adamant he could not recall the precise moment he strangled Doc Hinden, he recalled that he strangled the youth with the cord of his, Nilsson's, headphones as Doc Hinden listened to music, he also recalled dragging the youth across his floor with the wire wrapped around his neck as he strangled him, before pouring himself half a glass of rum and continuing to listen to music upon the headphones with which he had strangled Doc Hinden. The following day, Nelson purchased a Polaroid camera and photographed Ockenden's body in various suggestive positions. He then lay Ockenden's corpse spread gold above him on his bed as he watched television for several hours, before wrapping the body in plastic bags and stowing the corpse beneath the floorboards. On approximately four occasions over the following fortnight, Nelson disinterred Doc Hendon's body from beneath his floorboards and seated the body upon his armchair alongside him as he himself watched television and drank alcohol. Nelson killed his third victim, 16-year-old Martin Duffy, on May 17, 1980. Duffy was a catering student from Birkenhead, who had hitchhiked to London without his parents' knowledge on 13 May after being questioned by Merseyside police for evading his train fare. For four days, Duffy had slept rough near Euston Railway Station before Nelson encountered the youth as he returned from a union conference in Southport. Duffy, Nelson recollected, was both exhausted and hungry, and happily accepted Nelson's offer of a meal and a bed for the evening. After the youth had fallen asleep in Nelson's bed, Nelson fashioned a ligature around his neck, then simultaneously sat on Duffy's chest and tightened the ligature with a great force. Nilsson held this grip until Duffy became unconscious, he then dragged the youth into his kitchen and drowned him in his sink before bathing with the body, which he recollected as being the youngest looking I had ever seen. Duffy's body was first placed upon a kitchen chair, then upon the bed on which he had been strangled. The body was repeatedly kissed, complimented and caressed by Nilsson, both before and after he had masturbated while sitting upon the stomach of the corpse. For two days, the body of Martin Duffy was stowed in a cupboard, before Nelson noted the youth's body had become bloated, therefore, he went straight under the floorboards. Following Duffy's murder, Nelson began to kill with increasing frequency. Before the end of 1980, he was to kill a further five victims and attempt to murder one other, although only one of these victims whom Nelson murdered, 26-year-old William David Sutherland, has ever been identified. Nilsson's recollections of the unidentified victims are vague, although he graphically recalled how each victim had been murdered and just how long the body had been retained before dissection. One unidentified victim killed in November had moved his legs in a cycling motion as he was strangled. Nilsson is known to have absented himself from work between 11 and 18 November, likely due to this particular murder, 
another unidentified victim Nilsson had unsuccessfully attempted to resuscitate, before sinking to his knees, sobbing, before standing to expressly spit at his own image as he looked at himself in the mirror. On another occasion, he had lain in bed alongside the body of an unidentified victim as he listened to the classical theme fanfare for the common man before bursting into tears. Inevitably, the accumulated bodies beneath his floorboards attracted insects and created a foul odor, particularly throughout summer months. On occasions when Nilsson disinterred victims from beneath the floorboards, he noted that the bodies would be covered with pupae and infested with maggots, some victims' heads had maggots crawling out of eye sockets and mouths. Although Nilsson placed deodorants beneath the floorboards and sprayed insecticide about the flat twice daily, both the odor of decay and the presence of flies remained. In late 1980, Nilsson removed and dissected the bodies of each victim killed since December 1979 and burned them upon a communal bonfire he had constructed on waste ground behind his flat. To disguise the smell of the burning flesh of the six dissected bodies placed upon this pyre, Nilsson crowned the bonfire with an old car tire. Three neighborhood children stood to watch this particular bonfire, and Nilsson later wrote in his memoirs that he felt it would have seemed in order if he had seen these three children dancing around a mass funeral pyre. When the bonfire had been reduced to ashes and cinders, Nilsson used a rake to search the debris for any recognizable bones. Noting a skull was still intact, he smashed it to pieces with his rake. On or about January 4, 1981, Nilsson encountered an unidentified individual whom he described for investigators as an 18-year-old, blue-eyed young Scottish man 70, at the Golden Lion Pub in Soho. He was lured to Melrose Avenue upon the promise of partaking in a drinking contest. After Nilsson and this victim had consumed several beverages, Nilsson strangled him with a necktie, and subsequently placed the body beneath the floorboards. Nilsson is known to have informed his employers he was ill and unable to attend work on 12th of January in order that he could dissect both this victim and another unidentified victim he had killed approximately one month earlier. By April, Nilsson had killed two further unidentified victims, one of whom he described as an English skinhead whom he had met in Leicester Square, the other individual he described as Belfast Boy, a man in his early twenties, approximately five feet nine in height, who originated from Belfast. In relation to the first of these three unidentified victims, Nilsson later casually reflected, end of the day, end of the drink end of a person floorboards back, carpet replaced, and back to work at Denmark Street. The final victim to be murdered at Melrose Avenue was a 23-year-old named Malcolm Barlow, whom Nilsson discovered slumped against a wall outside his home on September 17, 1981. When Nilsson inquired as to Barlow's welfare, he was informed the medication Barlow was prescribed for his epilepsy had caused his legs to weaken. Nilsson informed Barlow he should be in hospital and, supporting him, walked the youth into his residence before phoning an ambulance. The following day, Barlow was released from hospital and returned to Nilsson's home, apparently to thank him. He was invited into Nilsson's residence and, after reading a meal, began drinking rum and coke before falling asleep on Nilsson's sofa. Nilsson manually strangled Barlow as he slept before stowing his body beneath his kitchen sink the following morning. In mid-1981, Nilsson's a landlord decided to renovate 195 Melrose Avenue, and asked Nilsson to vacate the property. Nilsson was initially resistant to the proposal, but accepted an offer of £1,000 from his a landlord to vacate his Melrose Avenue address in order that the property could be renovated. He moved into an attic flat at 23D Cranley Gardens in the Muswell Hill district of North London on October 5, 1981. The day before he vacated the property, Nelson burned the dissected bodies of the last five victims he had killed at this address upon a third and final bonfire he constructed in the garden behind his flat. Again, Nelson ensured the bonfire was crowned with an old car tire to disguise the smell of burning flesh. Nilsson had already dissected the bodies of four of these victims in January and August, 
and only needed to complete the dissection of Barlow for this third bonfire. At Cranley Gardens, Nelson had no access to a garden, and as he resided in an attic flat, he was unable to stow any bodies beneath his floorboards. For almost two months, any acquaintances Nelson encountered and lured to his flat were not assaulted in any manner, although he attempted to strangle a 19-year-old student named Paul Nas on November 23, 1981. In March 1982, Nelson encountered a 23-year-old named John Howlett as he, Nelson, drank in a pub located close to Leicester Square. Howlett was lured to Nelson's flat on the promise of continuing drinking with Nelson. At Cranley Gardens, both Nelson and Howlett drank as they watched a film, before Howlett walked into Nelson's front room and fell asleep in the bed, which was located in the front room at this time. One hour later, Nelson unsuccessfully attempted to rouse Howlett, then sat on the edge of the bed drinking rum as he stared at Howlett, before deciding to kill him. Following a ferocious struggle, in which Howlett himself attempted to strangle his attacker, Nelson strangled Howlett into unconsciousness with an upholstery strap before returning to his living room, shaking from the stress of the struggle in which he had believed he would be overpowered. On three occasions over the following ten minutes, Nelson unsuccessfully attempted to kill this victim after noting he had resumed breathing, before deciding to fill his bathtub with water and drown him. For over a week following Howlett's murder, Nelson's own neck bore the victim's finger impressions. In May 1982, Nelson encountered Carl St. Otter, a 21-year-old homosexual, as the youth drank at the Black Cap pub in Camden. Nelson engaged St. Otter in conversation, discovering the youth was depressed following a failed relationship. After plying the youth with alcohol, Nelson invited St. Otter to his flat assuring his guest he had no intention of sexual activity. At Nelson's flat, St. Otter consumed further alcohol before falling asleep upon an open sleeping bag, he later awoke to find himself being strangled as Nelson informed him, stay still. In his subsequent testimony at Nelson's trial, St. Otter stated he initially believed Nelson was trying to free him from the zip of the sleeping bag, before he returned to a state of consciousness. He then vaguely recalled hearing water running before realizing he was immersed in the water and that Nelson was attempting to drown him. After briefly succeeding in raising his head above the water, St. Otter gasped the words, No more, please. No more. Before Nelson again submerged St. Otter's head beneath the water. Believing he had killed St. Otter, Nelson seated the youth in his armchair, then noted his mongrel dog, Bleep licking St. Otter's face. Nelson realized the tiniest thread of life still clung in the youth, he rubbed St. Otter's limbs and heart to increase circulation, covered the youth's body in blankets, then lay him upon his bed. When St. Otter regained consciousness, Nelson embraced him, he then explained to St. Otter he had almost strangled himself on the zip of the sleeping bag, and that he had resuscitated him. Over the following two days, St. Otter repeatedly lapsed in and out of consciousness. When St. Otter had regained enough strength to question Nelson as to his recollections of being strangled and immersed in cold water, Nelson explained he had become caught in the zip of the sleeping bag following a nightmare, and that he had placed him in cold water as you were in shock. Nelson then led St. Otter to a nearby railway station, where he informed the youth he hoped they might meet again before he bade him farewell. Three months after Nelson's June 1982 promotion to the position of executive officer in his employment, he encountered a 27-year-old named Graham Allen attempting to hail a taxi in Shaftesbury Avenue. Allen accepted Nelson's offer to accompany him to Cranley Gardens for a meal. As had been the case with several previous victims, Nelson stated he could not recall the precise moment he had strangled Allen but recalled approaching him as he sat eating an omelette with the full intention of murdering him. Allen's body was retained in the bathtub for a total of three days before Nilsson began the task of dissecting his body upon the kitchen floor. Nilsson is again known to have informed his employers he was ill and unable to attend work on October 9, 1982, likely in order that he could complete the dissection of Allen's body, 
On January 26, 1983, Nelson killed his final victim, 20-year-old Stephen Sinclair. Sinclair was last seen by acquaintances of his in the company of Nelson, walking in the direction of a tube station. At Nelson's flat, Sinclair fell asleep in a drug and alcohol induced stupor in an armchair as Nelson sat listening to the rock opera Tommy. Nelson approached Sinclair, knelt before him, and said to himself, Oh, Stephen, here I go again, before strangling Sinclair with a ligature constructed with a necktie and a rope. Noting crepe bandages upon each of Sinclair's wrists, Nelson removed these to discover several deep slash marks from where Sinclair had recently tried to kill himself. Following his usual ritual of bathing the body, Nelson lay Sinclair's body upon his bed, applied talcum powder to the body, then arranged three mirrors around the bed before himself lying naked alongside the dead youth. Several hours later, he turned Stephen's head towards him, before kissing the youth's body on the forehead and saying, Good night, Stephen. Nelson then fell asleep alongside the body. As had been the case with both Hallett and Allen, Sinclair's body was subsequently dissected, with the various dismembered parts wrapped in plastic bags and stored in either a wardrobe, a tea chest or within a drawer located beneath the bathtub. The bags used to seal Sinclair's remains would be sealed with the same crepe bandages Nelson had found upon Sinclair's wrists. Nelson attempted to dispose of the flesh internal organs and smaller bones of all three victims killed at Cranley Gardens by flushing their dissected remains down his toilet. In a practice which he had conducted upon several victims killed at Melrose Avenue, he also boiled the heads, hands and feet to remove the flesh off these sections of the victims' bodies. On February 4, 1983, Nelson wrote a letter of complaint to estate agents complaining that the drains at Cranley Gardens were blocked and that the situation for both himself and the other tenants at the property was intolerable. The following day, he refused to allow an acquaintance to enter his property, the reason being he had begun to dismember the body of Stephen Sinclair on the floor of his kitchen. Nilsson's murders were first discovered by a dino rod employee named Michael Catron, who responded to the complaints made by both Dennis Nilsson and other tenants of 23 Cranley Gardens regarding the drains of the property being blocked on February 8, 1983. Opening a drain cover at the side of the house, Catron discovered the drain was packed with a flesh-like substance and numerous small bones of unknown origin. Catron reported his suspicions to his supervisor. Gary Wheeler. However, as he had arrived at the property at dusk, Catran and his supervisor agreed to postpone further investigation into the blockage until the following morning. Prior to leaving the property, Nelson and a fellow tenant named Jim Alcock convened with Catran to discuss the source of the substance. Upon hearing Catran exclaim how similar the substance was in appearance to human flesh, Nelson replied, it looks to me like someone has been flushing down their Kentucky Fried Chicken. At 7.30 a.m. the following morning, Catran and Wheeler returned to 23 Cranley Gardens, by which time the drain had been cleared. This aroused the suspicions of both the drain inspector and his supervisor. Catran discovered some scraps of flesh and four bones in a pipe leading from the drain which linked to the top flat of the house. To both Catran and Wheeler, the bones looked as if they originated from a human hand. Both men immediately called the police who, upon closer inspection, discovered further small bones and scraps of what looked to the naked eye like either human or animal flesh in the same pipe leading from the drain. These remains were taken to the mortuary at Hornsey, where pathologist Professor David Bowen advised police that the remains were indeed human and that one particular piece of flesh he concluded had been from a human neck bore a ligature mark. Upon learning from fellow tenants of 23 Cranley Gardens that the tenant of the top floor flat from where the human remains had been flushed was Dennis Andrew Nilsson, and that he worked in a job center in Kendish Town, Detective Chief Inspector Peter J and two colleagues opted to wait outside 23 Cranley Gardens until Nilsson returned home from work. When Nilsson returned home, DCIJ introduced himself and his colleagues, explaining they had come to inquire about the blockage in the drains from his flat. 
Nielsen asked why the police would be interested in his drains and also if the two officers present with Jay were health inspectors. In response, Jay informed Nielsen the other two were also police officers and requested access to his flat to discuss the matter further. The three officers followed Nielsen into his flat, where they immediately noted the odor of rotting flesh. Nielsen queried further as to why the police would be interested in his drains, to which he was informed the blockage had been caused by human remains. Nielsen feigned shock and bewilderment, stating, Good grief, how awful! In response, Jay replied, Don't mess about, where's the rest of the body? Nielsen responded calmly, admitting that the remainder of the body could be found in two plastic bags in a nearby wardrobe from which DCI Jay and his colleagues noted the overpowering smell of decomposition emanated. The officers did not open the cupboard, but asked Nilsson if there were any other body parts to be found, to which Nilsson replied, It's a long story, it goes back a long time. I'll tell you everything. I want to get it off my chest. Not here, at the police station. He was then arrested and cautioned on suspicion of murder, before being taken to Hornsey Police Station. As he was escorted to the police station by Detective Chief Inspector Jay and his colleagues, Nelson was asked whether the remains in his flat belonged to one person or two. Staring out of the window of the police car, he replied, 15 or 16, since 1978. That evening, a detective superintendent chambers accompanied Peter J. and Professor David Bowen to Cranley Gardens, where the plastic bags were removed from the wardrobe and taken to Hornsey Mortuary. One bag was found to contain two dissected torsos, one of which had been vertically dissected, and a shopping bag containing various internal organs. The second bag contained a human skull almost completely devoid of flesh, a severed head and a torso with arms attached but hands missing. Both heads were found to have been subjected to moist heat. In an interview conducted on 10th of February, Nelson confessed there were further human remains stowed in a tea chest in his living room, with other remains inside an upturned drawer in his bathroom. The dismembered body parts were the bodies of three men, all of whom he had killed by strangulation, usually with a tie. One victim he could not name. Another he knew only as John the Guardsman, and the third he identified as Stephen Sinclair. He also stated that, beginning in December 1978, he had killed 12 or 13 men at his former address, 195 Melrose Avenue. Nelson also admitted to having unsuccessfully attempted to kill approximately seven other individuals, who had either escaped or, on one occasion, had been at the brink of death but had been revived and allowed to leave his residence. A further search for additional remains at 23 Granley Gardens on 10th of February revealed the lower section of a torso and two legs stowed in a bag in the bathroom, and a skull, a section of a torso, and various bones in the tea chest. The same day, Nelson accompanied police to Melrose Avenue where he indicated the three locations in the rear garden where he had burned the remains of his victims, investigators would discover over 1,000 fragments of bone from the garden at Melrose Avenue, many of them blackened and charred by fire. The same day the search for additional remains at Cranley Gardens was conducted, plumber Michael Catran contacted the Daily Mirror, informing them of the ongoing search for human remains at Cranley Gardens. Although this newspaper was the sole editorial to publish any information pertaining to the case on 10th of February, Catran's revelations subsequently sparked an intense national media interest in the case and the unfolding events. By 11th of February, reporters from the Daily Mirror had obtained photographs from Nelson's mother in Aberdeenshire, which would appear on their front page the following day. As further details were revealed to the press over the following days revealing that Nelson had confessed to murdering more people than any other individual in British criminal history, the case attracted international press attention. Under English law, the police had 48 hours in which to charge Nelson or release him. Assembling the remains of the victims killed at Granley Gardens on the floor of Hornsey Mortuary. Professor David Bowen was able to confirm the fingerprints on one body matched those on police files of Stephen Sinclair.
At 5.40 p.m. on 11 February, Nelson was formally charged with the murder of Stephen Sinclair, and a statement revealing this fact was released to the press. Formal questioning of Nelson began the same evening, with Nelson agreeing to be represented by a solicitor, a facility he had earlier declined. Police would interview Nelson on 16 separate occasions over the following days, in interviews which would total over 30 hours. Nelson was adamant he was uncertain as to why he had killed, simply saying I'm hoping you will tell me that when asked his motive for the murders. He was adamant the decision to kill was not made until moments before the actual act of murder. Most victims had been killed by strangulation, although on several occasions, he had drowned the victims once they had been strangled into unconsciousness. Once the victim had been killed, he would typically bathe the victim's body, shave any hair from the torso to conform the body to his physical ideal, then apply makeup to any obvious blemishes upon the skin. The body would usually be dressed in socks and underpants, before Nelson would drape the victim's arms around him as he talked to the corpse. With most victims, Nelson would masturbate as he stood alongside or knelt above the body, and although Nelson confessed to having occasionally engaged in intercranial sex with his victims' bodies, he repeatedly stressed to investigators he had never penetrated his victims, harking that his victims were too perfect and beautiful for the pathetic ritual of commonplace sex. All the victims' personal possessions would be destroyed following the ritual of bathing their bodies in an effort to obliterate their identity prior to their murder and their now becoming what Nelson described as a prop in his fantasies. In several instances, Nelson would talk to the victim's body as it remained seated in a chair or prone on his bed and he harked to his being emotional as he marveled at the beauty of his victim's bodies. With reference to one victim, Kenneth Ockenden, Nelson harked that Ockenden's body and skin were very beautiful, adding the sight almost brought me to tears. Another, unidentified victim had been so emaciated that he had simply been discarded under the floorboards. The bodies of the victims killed at his previous address would be kept for as long as decomposition would allow. Upon noting any major signs of decomposition, Nelson would stow the body beneath his floorboards. If a body did not display any signs of decomposition, he would occasionally alternately stow the body beneath the floorboards and retrieve it before again masturbating as he stood over or lay alongside the body. Makeup would again be applied to the body to enhance its appearance and to obscure blemishes. When questioned as to why the heads found at Cranley Gardens had been subjected to moist heat, Nilsson stated that he had frequently boiled the heads of his victims in a large cooking pot on his stove in order that the internal contents would evaporate, thus removing the need to dispose of the brain and flesh. The torsos and limbs of the three victims killed at this address would be dissected within a week or so of their murder before being wrapped in plastic bags and stowed in the three locations he had indicated to police, the internal organs and smaller bones he would flush down the toilet. This practice, which had led to his arrest, had been the only method he could consider to dispose of the internal organs and soft tissue as, unlike at Melrose Avenue. He had no exclusive usage of the garden of the property. At Melrose Avenue, Nelson had typically retained the victims' bodies for a much longer period before disposing of the remains. He would keep three or four bodies stowed beneath the floorboards before he would dissect the remains, which he would wrap inside plastic bags and either return under the floorboards or, in two instances, place inside suitcases which had been left at the property by a previous tenant. The remains stowed inside suitcases, those of Kenneth Ockenden and Martin Duffy, were placed inside a shed in the rear garden, and were disposed of upon the second bonfire Nelson had constructed at Melrose Avenue. Other dissected remains, minus the internal organs, would be returned beneath the floorboards or placed upon a bonfire he had constructed in the garden. Nilsson confirmed that on four occasions, 
He had removed the accumulated bodies from beneath his floorboards and dissected the remains, and on three of these occasions, he had then disposed of the accumulated remains upon an assembled bonfire. On more than one occasion, he had removed the internal organs from the victims' bodies and placed them in bags, which he then typically dumped behind a fence to be eaten by wildlife. All the bodies of the victims killed at Melrose Avenue would be dismembered after several weeks or months of internment beneath the floorboards and Nelson recalled that the putrefaction of these victims' bodies would make this task exceedingly vile. He recalled having to fortify his nerves with whiskey and his having to grab handfuls of salt with which to brush aside maggots from the remains. Often, he would vomit as he dissected the bodies before wrapping the dismembered limbs inside plastic bags and carrying the remains to the bonfires. Nonetheless, immediately prior to his dissecting the victims' bodies, Nelson would engage in masturbation as he knelt or sat alongside the corpse. This, he stated, was his symbolic gesture of saying goodbye to his victims. When questioned as to whether he had any remorse for his crimes, Nelson replied, I wished I could stop, but I couldn't. I had no other thrill or happiness. He also emphasized that although he took no pleasure from the actual act of killing, he had worshipped the art and the act of death. On February 11, 1983, Dennis Nelson was officially charged with the murder of Stephen Sinclair. He was transferred to Brixton Prison to be held on remand until his upcoming trial. According to Nelson, upon being transferred to Brixton Prison to await trial, his mood was one of resignation and relief, and his belief was that he would be viewed, in accordance with law, as innocent until proven guilty. Although Nelson objected to wearing a prison uniform while on remand, he agreed to wear a uniform upon being informed no exception would be made in his case. In protest at having to wear a prison uniform and what he interpreted to be breaches of prison rules, Nilsson threatened to protest against his remand conditions by refusing to wear any clothes. As a result of this threat, he was not allowed to leave his cell. On 1 August, Nelson threw the contents of his chamber pot out of his cell, hitting several prison officers. This incident resulted in Nelson being found guilty on 9 August of assaulting prison officers and subsequently spending 56 days in solitary confinement. On May 26, 1983, Nelson was committed to stand trial at the Old Bailey on five counts of murder and two of attempted murder. A sixth murder charge would later be added. Throughout this committal hearing, Nelson was represented by a solicitor named Ronald Moss, whom he had previously dismissed as his legal representation on 21st of April, before Moss was again reappointed as Nelson's legal representative after Nelson had complained to magistrates he had been afforded no facilities with which he could mount his own defense. Moss was to remain Nelson's legal representative until July 1983, when Nelson, again expressing his intention to defend himself, discharged his legal aid. On 5th of August, Nelson reappointed Ronald Moss as his legal representative. Initially, Nelson had intended to plead guilty to each charge of murder at his upcoming trial. With Nelson's full consent, Ronald Moss had fully prepared Nelson's defense, however, five weeks before his trial, Nelson again dismissed the legal services of Ronald Moss, and opted instead to be represented by Ralph Hyams, upon whose advice Nelson agreed to plead not guilty by diminished responsibility. Dennis Nelson was brought to trial on October 24, 1983 charged with six counts of murder and two of attempted murder. He was tried at the Old Bailey, before Judge Sir David Croom Johnson. The trial began with Nelson being asked by the chief administrator of the court whether he entered a plea of guilty or not guilty in relation to each charge. In response to each charge, Nelson entered a plea of not guilty, 
Upon completion of his pleas, the jury was sworn into the courtroom. The primary dispute between the prosecuting and defense counsels was not whether Nilsson had killed, but his state of mind before, during and after he had killed. The prosecuting counsel, Alan Green, arguing that Nilsson was sane, in full control of his actions and had killed with premeditation, the defense counsel, Ivan Lawrence, arguing that Nilsson suffered from diminished responsibility rendering him incapable of forming the actual intention to commit murder, and should therefore be convicted of manslaughter as opposed to murder. The prosecution counsel opened the case for the Crown by describing the events of February 1983 leading to the identification of human remains in the drains at Cranley Gardens and the subsequent arrest of the defendant, the discovery of three dismembered bodies in Nelson's property his detailed confession, his leading investigators to the charred bone fragments of twelve further victims killed at Melrose Avenue, and the efforts Nelson had taken to conceal his crimes. In a tactful reference to the primary dispute between opposing counsels at the trial, Alan Green closed his opening speech with a reply Nelson had given to police in response to a question as to whether he needed to kill. At the precise moment of the act, of murder, I believe I am right in doing the act. To counteract this argument, Green added, the Crown says that even if there was mental abnormality, that was not sufficient to diminish substantially his responsibility for these killings. The first witness to testify for the prosecution was Douglas Stewart, who testified that in November 1980, he had awoken in Nelson's flat to find his ankles bound and Nelson strangling him as Nelson straddled him. Successfully overpowering Nelson, Stewart testified that Nelson had then shouted, Take my money. This, the prosecution attested, reflected Nelson's rational, cool presence of mind in that Nelson hoped to be overheard by other tenants. Upon leaving Nelson's residence, Stewart had reported the attack to police, who in turn questioned Nilsson. Noting conflicting details in accounts given by both men, police had dismissed the incident as a lover's quarrel. Upon cross-examination, the defense counsel sought to undermine Stewart's credibility, pointing to minor inconsistencies in the testimony, the fact he had consumed much alcohol on the night in question and suggesting his memory had been selectively magnified as he had previously sold his story to the press. On 25th of October the court heard testimony from two further men who had survived attempts by Nelson to strangle them. The first of these individuals, Paul Nas, provided testimony which the prosecution asserted was evidence of Nelson's self-control and ability to refrain from homicidal impulses. A university student, Nas testified that he accompanied Nelson to Cranley Gardens for alcohol and sex and woke in the early hours of the morning with a terrible headache. Upon washing his face in Nelson's bathroom, as Nas noted his eyes were bloodshot and his face completely red, Nelson had exclaimed, God! You look bloody awful! Nelson then advised the youth to see a doctor. Nas had not reported the attack to police for fear of his sexuality being discovered. Contrary to the prosecution claims, the defense counsel asserted that Nas' testimony reflected Nelson's rational self was unable to control his impulses. Moreover, the fact Nelson had selected a university student as a potential victim was at odds with the prosecution's claim that Nelson intentionally selected rootless individuals whose disappearance was unlikely to be noted. Immediately after the testimony of Paul Nas had concluded, Carl St. Otter took the stand to recount how, in May 1982, Nelson had attempted to strangle and drown him, before bringing him back to life. St. Otter's voice frequently quavered with emotion as he recounted how Nilsson had repeatedly attempted to drown him in his bathtub as he pleaded in vain for his life to be spared, and how he later awoke to find Nilsson's mongrel dog licking his face, on several occasions.
the judge had to allow St. Otter time to regain his composure. Nonetheless, the youth finished his testimony. The evidence provided by St. Otter was not included as part of the indictment against Nelson as his whereabouts were not known until after the indictment had been completed. Detective Chief Inspector Peter J. then recounted the circumstances of Nelson's arrest and his calm, matter-of-fact confessions, before reading to the court several statements volunteered by Nelson following his arrest. In one of these statements, Nelson had stated, I have no tears for my victims, I have no tears for myself, nor those bereaved by my actions. Jay admitted it was unusual for anyone accused of such horrific crimes to be so forthcoming in providing information, conceding upon questioning by the defense counsel that Nelson not only provided most of the evidence against himself, but also encouraged the discovery of evidence which could contradict his own version of events. Following the testimony of DCIJ, Detective Superintendent Chambers recited Nelson's formal confession to the court. This testimony included graphic descriptions of the ritualistic and sexual acts Nelson performed with his victims' bodies, his various methods of storage of bodies and or body parts dismemberment and disposal, and the problem's decomposition, particularly regarding colonies of maggots, afforded him. Several members of the jury were visibly shaken throughout much of this testimony, others looked at Nelson with incredulous expressions on their faces as Nelson listened to the testimony with apparent indifference. This testimony lasted until the following morning when the prosecution included several exhibits into evidence. This included the cooking pot in which Nilsson had boiled the heads of the victims killed at Granley Gardens, the cutting board Nilsson had used to dissect John Howlett, and several rusted catering knives which had formerly belonged to victim Martin Duffy. Two psychiatrists testified upon behalf of the defense. The first of these, Dr. James McKeith began his testimony on 26th of October. McKeith testified as to how, through a lack of emotional development, Nelson experienced difficulty expressing any emotion other than anger, and his tendency to treat other human beings as components of his fantasies. The psychiatrist also described Nelson's association between unconscious bodies and sexual arousal stating that Nelson possessed narcissistic traits, an impaired sense of identity, and was able to depersonalize other individuals. He stated his conclusions that Nelson displayed many signs of maladaptive behavior, the combination of which, in one man, was lethal. These factors could be attributed to an unspecified personality disorder from which McKeith believed Nelson suffered. In response to prosecution contention that, in attributing Nelson to an unspecified disorder, McKeith was therefore undecided in his conclusions, McKeith contended that this unspecified personality disorder was severe enough to substantially reduce Nelson's responsibility. The second psychiatrist to testify for the defense, Dr. Patrick Galwe, diagnosed Nelson with a borderline false self as if pseudo-normal, narcissistic personality disorder, with occasional outbreaks of schizoid disturbances that he, Nilsson, managed most of the time to keep at bay, however, Galway stated, in episodic breakdowns, Nilsson would become predominantly schizoid, acting in an impulsive, violent and sudden manner. Gawi further added that an individual suffering from these episodic breakdowns is most likely to disintegrate under circumstances of social isolation. In effect, Nelson was not guilty of malice aforethought. Upon cross-examination, Alan Green largely focused upon the degree of awareness shown by Nelson and his ability to make decisions. Dr. Galway conceded that Nelson was intellectually aware of his actions, although he stressed that, due to his personality disorder, Nelson did not appreciate the nature of his actions. On 31 October, 
the prosecution called Dr. Paul Bowden to testify in rebuttal of the psychiatrists who had testified for the defense counsel. Prior to Nelson's trial, Dr. Bowden had interviewed the defendant on 16 separate occasions in interviews totaling over 14 hours. Over two days, Dr. Bowden testified that, although he found Nelson to be abnormal in a colloquial sense, he had concluded Nelson to be a manipulative individual who had been capable of forming relationships, but had forced himself to objectify people. Refuting the testimony of Dr. McKeith and Dr. Galway, Bowden further testified he had found no evidence of maladaptive behavior, and that Nelson suffered from no disorder of the mind. Following the closing arguments of both prosecution and defense, the jury retired to consider their verdict on November 3, 1983. The following day, the jury returned with a majority verdict of guilty upon six counts of murder and one of attempted murder, with a unanimous verdict of guilty in relation to the attempted murder of Paul Nas. The judge sentenced Nelson to life imprisonment with a recommendation that he serve a minimum of 25 years imprisonment. Following his conviction, Nelson was transferred to Wormwood Scrubs Prison to begin his sentence. As a category of prisoner, Nelson was assigned his own cell, although he was able to mix freely with other inmates. Nelson did not lodge an appeal, accepting that the Crown case, that he had had the capacity to control his actions and that he had killed with premeditation, was essentially correct. He would further elaborate on the day of his conviction that he took an enormous thrill from the social seduction, the getting the friend back, the decision to kill, the body and its disposal. Nelson also added that the sole reason at least two of his attempted murders had been unsuccessful was due to the fact he had consumed too much alcohol. In December 1983, Nelson was attacked with a razor blade by an inmate named Albert Moffat, who inflicted wounds to Nelson's face and chest which required 89 stitches to heal. Following this attack, Nelson was briefly transferred to Parkhurst Prison, before being transferred to Wakefield Prison, where he was to remain until 1990. The following year, Nelson was transferred to a vulnerable prisoner unit at HMP Full Sutton upon concerns for his safety. He was to remain at Full Sutton until 1993, when he was transferred to Whitemore Prison, again as a category of prisoner, and with increased segregation from other inmates. The minimum term of 25 years to life imprisonment to which Nilsson was sentenced in 1983 was replaced by a whole life tariff by the Home Secretary, Michael Howard, in December 1994. This ruling ensures Dennis Nilsson will never be released from prison, although Nilsson has repeatedly expressed no desire to obtain freedom, insisting that he fully accepts his punishment. In 2003, Nelson was again transferred to HMP Full Sutton, where he remains incarcerated as a category of prisoner. In the prison workshop, Nelson translates books into Braille. He spends much of his free time reading, painting, and composing music upon a keyboard. He also exchanges letters with numerous individuals who have sought his correspondence. Dennis Nelson is known to have killed a minimum of 12 young men and boys between 1978 and 1983, although it is suspected that the true number of victims may be 15. At least nine victims had been killed at 195 Melrose Avenue, with his final three victims being killed at 23 Granley Gardens. Of Nelson's eight identified victims, only three, Stephen Holmes. Kenneth Ockenden and Graham Allen, had a permanent address at the time of their murder, with the remaining victims largely, though not exclusively, consisting of vagrants, runaways and male prostitutes. In 1992, Nelson would claim that the true total of victims he had claimed was 12, and that he had fabricated three additional victims he initially confessed to having killed at Melrose Avenue.
both in response to pressure as he was interviewed and to simply stick with the figure of approximately 15 victims he had provided investigators with as he was escorted to the police station. Nelson has claimed that three unidentified victims he had initially confessed to killing, an Irishman in September 1980, a hippie in November or December 1980, and a skinhead in April 1981, had been invented to simply complement the continuity of evidence. However, Detective Chief Inspector Jay dismisses Nelson's claims to have only killed 12 victims stating that in the more than 30 hours of interviews police had conducted with Nilsson, when discussing the 15 victims he had initially confessed to killing, he had never provided any inconsistencies in the physical characteristics, the date or place of encounter, the act of murder, or the ritual he observed with the body of any of the 15 victims. 15 Victims